right, so it is time for the afternoon sessions of Big Talk with Small Libraries 2024. Um, I'm your host, Krista Porter, for the day here from the Nebraska Library Commission. And starting today, now we are going to have um, Katarina and Bailey from the James Hammer Hamner Public Library in Virginia uh, talk about their after school meals program which I think is a really awesome thing that someone previously talked about um, food insecurity. So this is something that's going on everywhere, having any, uh, people are dealing with this. So um, I will uh, just hand it over to you both to tell us all about what you're doing there in Virginia for this. All right, thanks, Krista. Have you just been going all day without a break there? <laughs> I, I There've been a few breaks. I've been here all day. Yeah, this is what I do on, on, this, on the day of big talk. <laughs> Great. Well, um, so I'm Katarina Spears. I'm the library director for uh, the James L. Hammer Public Library, and I have Bailey Hughes with me who um, kind of runs the program day to day. So I'm going to talk about um, just a little overview about the program and administration of the program, and then Bailey will talk about the actual execution of the program. So um, we're in Amelia County, Virginia, um, which is about 35 miles outside of Richmond, Virginia. The, um, this is, Amelia has long been a agricultural community. It's very rural, it's very spread out. Um, we're in kind of the nucleus, the courthouse district, uh, where the library is located, um, our administrative buildings, um, you know, for people who live in the village, a few businesses and restaurants. And then uh, we have three public schools in the county, an elementary, middle, and high school. Those are all um, within a mile of the library. We also have a small uh, private school in, in the county, the Amelia Academy, which is uh, like half a mile at that. Um, and then we have a lot of homeschool families in the county. So um, uh, because we are within, you know, 35 miles of an urban center, a lot of our parents um, have a long commute morning and evening. And so we have a fair number of kids who come to the library after school. They can walk here. Actually, some of them get dropped off by the bus here because they get dropped off at the library. They stay for the evening or the afternoon, and then their parents pick them up on their way home from work back into town. Um, one of our sheriff's deputies was telling me yesterday that his daughter gets dropped off here, um, the school bus, and he picks her up on his way home from work. Um, so that is kind of a, just a snapshot of, of who we are and um, uh, oh, we serve a population of 13,400 in the county. But as I say, we're very spread out. So, um, so the immediate downtown area is, is not anywhere near that, but it's, it's a big um, rural county. So the first question that um, occurred to me is whether or not your school, your library is an ideal space for an after school meals program. Um, the way it happened with us here is that our local public school system lost funding um, and in order to make cuts one of the things that they had to cut was after school programming um, so an after school meal partner has to be able to provide enriching activities for young people um, the kids don't necessarily have to participate in those activities but they they do have to be available so I mean, we're a library we have books we have board games we have um, video game consoles that people can check out and use while they're on site. Um, so the enrichment piece was already built in, of course, um, at the school. They would have to have not only people chaperoning, but they'd have to provide some form of um, activities for the kids. Um, our library has a small public meeting room uh, with no tables in there. We can fit, fit about 30 people comfortably or uncomfortably, maybe. Um, uh, we already have existing partnerships, she says hesitantly, with our local public school. We'd like them to be stronger, um, but and this we saw as an opportunity to create a stronger relationship with our local public schools, so, um, so we were enthusiastic about taking on the project because of that. Um, as I mentioned, we already have students who utilize the library during after-school hours. I mean, we have parents who bring younger children, um, and then of course the, the teens and tweens who make their way over here on their own to hang out with their friends. Um, you know, certain times of the year, like when the Pee Wee football practice is happening in the field behind the library, uh, we get more kids who were dropping in because either they have a sibling who's participating or they've just finished participating in, in after school sports right in the neighborhood. 
We've got a rec center across the street. So that brings more kids to our area. Um, and uh, the other bonus of having the after school meal program here rather than the school is that uh, these meals are now accessible to all members of the community. So that includes homeschool families and private school families. It is not restricted. Um, we don't have to do any kind of verification that somebody attends the public school in order to access the meals. It's anybody under um, 18 or 18 and under. So um, this program was started in the 90s, which is why the name of it is At Risk After School Meals. Uh, that was terminology that we used back then, and um, I don't think we, most libraries don't use that as much anymore. Uh, back then they used to talk a lot about at-risk readers, and I never really was sure <laughs> what that meant. But um, so it was originally dubbed the at, it was at risk after school snacks program. So I use at risk, but that is the official title. Um, so this was a program uh, created, um, uh, it was designed to engage community partners, provide children a safe place to go after school, access nutritious food that allows them to concentrate on homework and join their friends in social and physical activities. So um, the program is uh, funded by the USDA. It's a component of the Child and Adult Care Food Program. It is um, managed by the US Department of Agriculture School Nutrition Service. And so which usually that funding is then passed along to your state Department of Education. And then those funds are distributed to public schools throughout the state, but also private schools. I mean, there are some private schools um, if they have enough students in the school who qualify financially for free and reduced lunches, um, according to the you know federal standards for that, which is um, 200 a family living at 200 percent of the federal at or below the federal poverty rate. So I mean there are some private schools that do qualify for USDA lunches, um, and that will have a school nutrition service funded by the state. Um, but of course, usually we associate it with public schools. So this started um, as a program in a few select states to provide at-risk after-school snacks, and that's been available since the 90s, as I said, when this program was named. And then later, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 expanded the reimbursement for after-school meals to all 50 states. Um, so your funding that you're applying for for this program is through the State Department of Education School Nutrition Program. We, um, at our location, partner with our local public schools to um, to offer this program. It's not necessary. You can register uh, your organization, um, your library, yourself for this program. It's just for us, given our small staff and the fact that the school nutrition program already exists in our county, it made sense to do it in partnership with the school. Um, so if you're a public library or even a private nonprofit 501c3, a uh, public library, um, chances are um, your organization qualifies. Um, the the after school program eligibility is that you're organized to provide care for students after school. Uh, we're not really providing supervised care um, here for kids. If you're 12 and over, you can be in the library um, under your own power and without supervision. Um, and we do have uh, a provision that allows older siblings to bring in young, you know, siblings who are under 12 um, with them. Um, you need to provide regularly scheduled education enrichment activities. As I said, the students are not required to participate as long as the activities are available. In our case, that's, um, and Bailey will talk more about this, but that's sometimes we just put like a deck of Uno cards and a couple of board games in the room where they eat. So um, we are, sometimes offering after school programs, but for the most part, it's it's passive programming. It's, you know, word searches and craft packets and things like that. Um, and you need to be located in an attendance area of school where at least 50% of children are eligible for free or reduced price meals. So again, that's 200% or below the federal poverty level. Um, Amelia County definitely qualifies for that. Uh, we actually have a higher rate of um, low-income school children or children who come from low-income families than the overall population. So while the overall population of the county is, I think, like 43% living at 200% or below the, the federal poverty level, 
within the school that climbs um, that percentage climbs much higher. So um, the school is is uh, applying based on their population. So um, you can localize it. Um, it doesn't just have to be your county. It could be a smaller portion um, through census blocks that you're doing that. Um, organizational eligibility, public agencies, right, such as we are, or tax exempt if you're a nonprofit uh, organization library, and even some for-profit uh, daycare centers meet those eligibility requirements. So I have down there at the bottom um, the resources, and we'll happily share all of this later for anyone who's interested. Um, the um, handbook that goes through all the eligibility requirements. And so um, program administration, um, as I said, we partner with our local public school nutrition program to offer this. Um, and that quotation, the application process being fairly painless, that was a quote from our um, the gentleman who manages our school nutrition program is also the finance director for the school um, department of schools. And so um, he actually filled out the application for us and said it was, you know, no big deal. Um, the administrative time, he said, for the school is nothing extra um, if a school nutrition program already exists. Um, and this, uh, you know, the cost for the school is neutral to profitable, meaning that if you've already got a school nutrition program in place, um, you're already working with an outside contractor or you're employing people to work in your lunchrooms. So the way that it works here, um, the staff at the school serves both breakfast and lunch to the students. And then in the afternoon, uh, right before school closes, they prepare the snacks. They drive them over here, drop them off um, for us right after school, and then shortly after that, we start serving them. So the USDA um, or the State Department of Education reimburses the school for the cost of the meals, but then also um, for a portion of the cost of um, paying the, the folks who prepare those meals. So that means that um, in, some t in some cases, the school actually makes a little bit of a profit. Um, on the program. Um, for your facility, you would need to provide a certificate of occupancy, which we didn't even have when our county is so small that I uh, went across the street to our building permit person and told him we didn't have one and he just kind of put one together right then. Um, we also are so small, we don't have a fire marshal in our county, we only have a volunteer fire squad. Um, and so we asked a fire marshal from a neighboring county to come over and do a fire inspection for us and, and get us certified. So we had to do both of those things when we started this program. Um, and one of the things also said by the gentleman we work with at the public schools is that since librarians are natural record keepers, uh, it makes some reporting so much easier for him because there is, as you'll see when, when Bailey's talking, a fair amount of um, record keeping we, we do. Um, periodically, the school, um, the program administrators at the school um, have to come and observe to make sure that we're following the regulations. Um, we do have USDI guidelines for all of those things. Um, the sign that you see on this slide is one of the um, signs that we're required to post. Um, that you know, we meet USDA nutrition standards, um, that you, if you need to make a request because you've got a food allergy or uh, dietary restrictions, that those um, needs can be met and there's contact information um, so that you have someone to whom you can complain if there's a problem. Um, so that's one of the posted notices. I think we also have to have um, uh, basically non-discrimination, you know, posting saying that we don't discriminate against anyone who comes in seeking a meal. Um, and that is pretty much it for me. So I'm going to slide over and let Bailey come in here and talk about um, the, uh, the actual day-to-day um, -day for the program. Great. Literally slide over. <laughs> Hi, my name's Bailey Hughes. I am, like she said, one of the librarians here, and I'm kind of the boots on the ground for this. So that's kind of what I'll be talking about. So how often do we offer this? Um, we do Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and we offer food from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Um, that is, 5.30 is the last time we'll hand out food, but the room is available for the program until 6. 
So we don't kick them out at 5.30. We might kick them out at 6 because we do typically have programs at 6 or we close at 6. Um, and we chose these times because it's when we see the most teenagers. Um, this is between school letting out and when parks and rec activities actually start. So this is not you know, required by anyone. These are just times that we picked. And we're gonna continue this program over summer, but we're right now in the process of discussing when that will be, um, when we can best serve our community. So staff training is really, really simple. Um, all six staff members are now trained and we actually just set up a new schedule where we're all gonna be rotating shifts. And really, I mean, it ends up being, you know, you're doing this once every other week. So it's really not a big commitment on individual parts. Training doesn't take long, like I said, and after we were initially trained by um, the school representative, we can now train each other. So it's all in-house after that. Um, the important stuff staff should know is how to set up and clean up, how to answer questions you know, accurately pertaining to the program, and like I'll go over, record the stats and fill the forms out accurately. Um, I came up with like a checklist, so that way if you know a staff member goes to set up and clean up, and um, there's also some questions, like frequently asked questions on there. So there's like a physical form that each staff member can go through and check off if they're not completely comfortable but training super easy. Keeping stats, so like she said, like Kat said, um, stats are really important. And in the past, the school has had problems keeping up with all these stats. So, you know, librarians are good record keepers. So we're pretty meticulous about this. Um, the form you see in the top left is from the school nutrition program. Like that is a USDA form. Um, I think everything else is something that we have created. So the daily meal count and attendance form, um, it tracks weekly delivery times and how many were delivered, which again will be up to how much you see that your community needs it and uses it. We record how many students ate and how many students used the space did not eat. Um, so that's how many students actually took a meal and sometimes we have tutors come in with students. So we'll record the tutor there and the students who actually ate versus the tutor who can't get the meals, but we'll still record that. And then I take this document and upload it every time, every day, to a shared Google Drive folder so the representative from the public schools can see it as well. So it's an easy way for everyone to see the stats. Allergies and dietary restrictions. Any new student that we see who is 13 and up, we ask them if they have an allergy or dietary restriction. Um, and then we record it on the page that you see below the daily meal count form. Um, and anyone who is 12 or younger should have a parent or guardian with them. We'll ask them and keep stats for that as well. And then we report these back to the representative at the Amelia County Public Schools so that they can accommodate in the future. And the biggest one that we've really seen is lactose intolerance, which is really common. But other than that, we haven't come up with a real issue. And since we're working through the schools, um, at least for the students who are enrolled in public schools, they would know if there was like a severe one like peanut allergy, which again, we have not run across yet. Keeping more stats. So these are a couple more that um, I actually designed. Sign-in sheets, the biggest one. Students 13 and up, they've gotten really good at just walking up, signing their name and taking their food. 12 and younger, we see fewer of, but we do see them and they have a parent actually sign that and fill out that. And that's to ensure their safety and make sure that someone is there who is responsible for them. And that follows our library policy. It also helps us track ages of the people who are actually using the program. And it's a good backup stat for how many um, people come in so we can have a backup for the daily meal count and attendance form, just to make sure we're keeping very accurate stats. And something we're really proud of is we make sure that none of this food goes to waste. It's kind of hard to, I guess, predict how many students you're going to have every given week. Our numbers can range all over the place. Um, sometimes we run out during the week and we have to contact the schools again. And then sometimes, like this form, we had 19 meals left over, which is pretty extreme, actually. So we never want to waste anything. So we, every week, take these leftovers to our friends at the Amelia Food Pantry. Um, so. You know, if you decide to start this program, you could find somewhere to actually take this. And then on the right, I do have, um, yeah, one of our deliveries for the food pantry. And then the form you see is 
another thing that I upload to the shared Google Drive folder, and it is just a record again so the schools can see how many meals we're taking each week. All right, so what's it really like? You know, we can talk about the procedures all day, but I do want to say it is a big commitment and it can definitely be a big commitment for small libraries and for small staff members, but it does make a really, really big impact and obvious reasons why it covers food insecurity. So we know that students don't socialize as well, they don't learn as well, just their life can be so much more improved when you cover that food security. Students have a place to go after school. Library is already a place to go after school, but this gives them you know, more encouragement to come hang out with us where there are much worse places that they could be. And then you get to know your patrons. I'm now on a first name basis with a lot of these students that otherwise I probably wouldn't get to know. I mean, when you add free food into the equation, you're gonna see patrons come in a lot more or patrons that wouldn't normally come in. And it's good PR for the library and the public school system. Um, we get a lot of people asking like, well, what are you doing out here? And the first thing we say is, well, we've partnered up with the public schools. Um, so it's it's good PR for both sides. And Kat mentioned earlier, you grow your relationship with the public schools. Sometimes it's hard to get an in in the public schools and this lets them know we're here and we're reliable and we have a contact person. And that is it. And here is our emails and our phone number if you wanna reach out for more questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Katarina and Bailey. Um, much shorter, a shorter session. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so, um, anybody have, um, anybody has, if anyone has any questions, get them typed in the questions section. Um, so we have plenty of time here to answer all the questions. We'll leave that slide up there with your contact info uh, for the library and for yourself, so people have that if they need. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as I said at the beginning, this was a, a, one of the sessions I was looking forward to. This is definitely something that I'll, everyone in the country, big or small, is dealing with is food insecurity. Um, and it's great that there is the funding and um, these plant programs available somewhere, everywhere, anywhere um, for people to um, have access to it. Um, all right, so we do have some questions coming in here. Let's see. Um, <laughs> All right, can you talk about the actual food that comes? Like how is how does it come? How is it packaged? Um, yeah. Do you need any sort of like an actual full kitchen facility at the library to handle or deal with any of the food? Or I get like, you know, sink, refrigerator. Yeah. yeah, so all that we need here is basically a big enough refrigerator to keep this. Um, this isn't, you know, something that the USDA provides, but the schools actually bring them in these big insulated bags and then we just throw them in our staff fridge. And it does take up a big portion of our staff fridge, but luckily we do have the space for that. Um, I would recommend having a microwave too. We don't have one currently, but that would be a good thing to reheat food. Um, so the requirements for the bags, they have to have, and correct me if you know I missed something, a fruit, a vegetable, a carb, and then a drink with it. And normally it's like milk. Um, and they prepackage these bags for us. So, you know, we do no food handling. It's all the public schools who bring it over. Mm -hmm. um, we just store them until then. But a lot of times what we see is a sandwich. Sometimes there's chips, sometimes there's carrots and celery. Um, it's stuff that you would expect from a school. Yeah, and I, I will say there's, um, there's uh, there are certain requirements that are part of the training like um, the kids are required to consume part of the food on site but not all of the food on site so they um, have to I believe is it eat the sandwich here but they can take the fruit well they can take either a fruit or a carb and for go. sandwiches that does fall under carb right it's a little you know gray area but that would also be like a dinner roll or chips um, but they can also take the apple or the you know I think we've seen like kiwis and plums so they can take any of that with them but yeah. they cannot take the entire meal with them yeah and there was um you know they they give us some variety sometimes we have you know uh, we always have pb and j for mm -hmm. the kind of picky eaters but sometimes they give us ham sandwiches sometimes they give us 
uh, cold pizza. Sometimes um, the spicy chicken sandwiches were very popular for a while. So um, uh, it just depends on what your school nutrition folks, um, or if you were to do a program like this on your, undertake this on your own without partnerships with the schools, whatever the food contractor is providing, um, as long as and they, you know, the USDA standards are, are part of that um, that overall training guide. Let's see. In the at risk after school meals guide that I had mm -hmm. earlier in the presentation. So, right, you definitely need to work with someone else, someone else who would provide, you know, prepare and put together the the food. So, so what, yeah. what I, I noted to myself a question about how. Um, did do librarians need to get like a food handler's license or permit or anything? But since you're not actually doing anything, you don't have to worry about that. Right. I mean, you can you can work with um, a local um, food contractor. I mean, some kind of a catering company or something like that, as mm -hmm. long as they are um, you know matching the USDA requirements for the meals to have all the different components. Like Bailey was saying, a fruit, a vegetable. You know, mm -hmm. like we almost always get carrots for them as their vegetable, which we found um, very quickly. They would only eat if they had ranch dressing. So, um, <laughs> so we started carrying those little ranch dressing, um, you know, sachets, so mm -hmm. that they could eat their carrots. Um, okay, great. Um, and that looks like that was a lot of the questions. Let's see, I've got other ones here that I gotta go through. Um, oh, something else I was gonna mention, sorry about that question with the, is that the school told us um, that if we wanted a new refrigerator, they could purchase it for us. Or if we um, needed equipment of any kind, that they can get reimbursed for it through the USDA. So if you don't, if you only have, you know, a mini fridge in your library and you, um, uh, need to acquire a bigger refrigerator uh, or replace your existing one because it's old or something like that. That is something that the USDA will reimburse for. Nice. That's well, yeah, if they're providing food in, through their program, that makes sense. Um, I wonder about if the microwave, you're talking about this, you said they've been, they provide cold pizza sometimes. And I know some people, depending on what the toppings are, I'm all about cold pizza, um, but some kids might not be. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that does kind of open you up to um, if you're if you're heating the food, and it's one of the reasons we haven't done it here yet, according to the school nutrition, um, is that we would have to get some additional training for food yeah. handling, um, which I've had before. You know, when I worked in a restaurant, I had a food handler's license, mm -hmm. and it's just basic things like, you know, knowing what temperature to heat things to and what temperature to store things. And so, if oh, you were going to actually be heating the food on site. Um, you'd need to take that extra step. And that's just something we haven't done yet because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a lot. It's already a lot for a small staff. So sure, sure. Um, so so there's a so um, is there um, so there's a mixture of options every day, not just every, you know, on Tuesday, everyone's getting a ham sandwich. There's multiple kids have a choice. Yeah, so they do provide us with choices, um, at least two choices every time, sometimes three, but we always get PB&Js, which is a good, you know, vegetarian option. Um, and then we usually get, you know, she mentioned cold pizza or they'll do turkey or ham wraps. Um, we've had spicy chicken sandwiches, but um, like I said, there's either two or three options that they can have. And everything else in those kits are the same. It's just that one main carb or sandwich. Sure, sure. Yeah, and once somebody identifies a dietary restriction like lactose intolerance, um, we just request, um, I think we had a carton of oat milk here for a while because mm -hmm. there was a child that was lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. um, or we, you know, that's what that form is for. If we report things, then they start making sure that a meal is provided to accommodate those dietary restrictions. And if anyone wants to start this kind of program, I came up with most of those forms. I'm more than happy to share those with you. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And your contact info is in the slides, which will be available afterwards. So perfect. Um, and you mentioned having a small staff. Um, someone wants to know how many staff members do you have? And I don't we have six. Um, one is part time, but they are all trained um, to do this program as well. And like I said, we're all going to be doing it soon. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, on our staff, we have Bailey and I are considered the program 
managers, I think, were because we got training directly from the school, um, which was, I think, 30 or 45 minutes that we sat mm-hmm. with the school nutrition officer. And he walked us through things like, um, you know, the diversity, equity and inclusion, um, the food safety, um, you know, keeping the statistics and and how to do that and then after that 45 minutes that we spent with him we are now qualified to train anybody on our staff because we're considered program managers for this so he's the overall program administrator overseeing all the communication with usda ordering the meals you know filing all the paperwork and then we're the on-site uh managers for the program Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um Okay, uh, let's just go up to the top here. Um, so this question, I think it's something that I had said wondering about any, uh, have you received any um, pushback regarding sharing of files from parents? Um, allergies make me think about HIPAA. Um, I was wondering about that too, about privacy issues with the children's info. You said you have them sign in. Um, what, how, how are you dealing with all of that with privacy and allergies and HIPAA and, do you keep those sign-in sheets or are they destroyed afterwards for your, you know, your typical library privacy issues? <laughs> yeah. So when I made those forms, I made sure that the kid's name is not associated with it. Um, and even when they're signing in like the 13 and up, I don't require them to put their last name. Um, and okay. the allergy form itself, see where that guy is. Yep. So it just says the type and the date that we received this information um, and whether or not we were able to give them what they needed that day. So, so I don't actually associate that child with the name. Who had the issue, just that there was. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, no personally identifying information is actually there. Right. Yeah. So right. it's mo- it's mostly that if you're consistently not meeting a need in the community, that's what this form is about. That um, you know you're consistently turning people away because you're not providing you know oat milk or because you're not providing vegetarian options then it's a red flag for the um state department of education and they'll because all this of course gets reported to them and so they're going to come to you and say well you know why aren't you making an effort to if you've had to turn people away on all these dates so Mm -hmm. that's the main reason for that tracking it's not to track the individual because somebody could come in one day request oat milk and then never come back but after mm-hmm. that, we're carrying oat milk, right? And so, milk. yeah, yeah, it's totally a drop-in program. It's not, um, mm-hmm. it's, you know, we're not verifying. Even though a lot of the kids who are taking advantage of this program aren't necessarily kids who are um, qualified financially for free and reduced lunches at school. But mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't matter to us. We anybody who is 18 or under. Um, and that's 18 if you're, you know, you started, you're still in your senior year of high school or something. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyone 18 and under can walk in here and request a meal and get it for free. Right. So there's no requirements. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, let's see. Next up, do you or the school have to apply for this program annually or is it just a one time thing and it keeps going? How does that work for each year? Um, we've already qualified as um, a facility, so we won't have to do that again. It's just, um, you know, he'll, he will resubmit um, basically the uh, financial request, but no, we won't have to be re-registered as an institution. Um, we are, we are on the books as one. So the summer program is actually, because we will do summer meals, we'll transition at the end of the school year to doing summer meals. We're probably going to do them at lunchtime. Um, you know, the Parks and Rec has a day camp across the street, so they can bring the kids over here for the for free meals. Um, that's a totally separate pot of money, so he'll apply for that separately because all of these programs are kind of siloed in financial ways, and so um, so he'll uh, apply for that separately. Um, and we'll have to, this will be our first time being a facility for summer meals. So we'll have to go through this again for the summer meals. But for the after school meals, um, no, um, he'll just reapply for, for funding in the fall like they do every year. Okay. Um, and I think this might relate to another question someone has that you only do it three days a week. Um, is that part of the funding restriction or did you just, you know, how did you come up with doing that? And do you have the option for which days or how many? How did, how did you, how did you come upon doing those particular days? And you want to take that one? Yeah. 
So no, there there is not a restriction on how often you just have to work with your public schools um, and you have to work with, you know, what you've got at your library. So we restricted it to three days a week for that amount of time, because again, it's when we saw the most uh, teenagers. Um, and again, it, it kind of landed in a good spot where we thought we could feed the most people without, you know, interrupting school or interrupting after school activities at Parks and Rec particularly. Um, let's see. It's also our only program and meeting space in the library. Yes. So um, since we have to have a dedicated space and your dedicated space can be a table in your library where they eat um but uh it doesn't have to be a separate room but for our purposes you know if you have 15 kids coming by to eat after school meals you don't really we don't really want them to necessarily do that in the main part of the library um in our our meeting and event space our program space that one little room um, it's just in constant demand. So we have regular programs um, that utilize that space on the other days. But um, yeah, so this, I think, if we were trying to do it five days a week, might be a little too overwhelming for the staff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can offer it one day a week. If you're open late one evening um, or you have a lot of family activities on a specific day of the week, you know, where you have drop-in homework help or something like that, you can schedule this program to just be part of that program um, mm -hmm. and not do it the rest of the week. So yeah, tailor it to what works for your library and what's going on in your library, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we are actually closed on Mondays and Friday we have a reoccurring uh, club that we already had during that time, which is why you know mm -hmm. it was restricted to those three days. But it does, you know, three days, I think, is really adequate for the students that we see. Are you still going to do the three days for summer or are you changing that up at all? I think we're going to continue three days. But again, we're going to, you know, we're actually meeting next week to talk with the mm -hmm. school representative and then we'll work it out with him. Uh, let's see. Someone wants to know um, how many students can you support in the program? And um, mm -hmm. have you ever turned a student away? I we have not had to turn a student out away. Food. There has there has been a couple of times where we run out of food in the middle of the week. So we actually talked to the school um, representative and we upped that number. So now we get 25 meals a week and that usually covers it for the whole week. Um, other than that, no, we have never had to turn a student away. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, when the student came in with a lactose intolerance, we did, you know, tell him just avoid the milk and he was able to eat the rest of the meal. Yeah. Um, we, like she said, we can comfortably hold 30 people in that room, but it's never reached that before. Yeah, during football, uh, the Pee Wee football, and they practice on the field out behind the library in the fall, we were doing sometimes 15 kids in an afternoon doing meals. So it really fluctuates during the course of the school year based on, you know, what's happening in the community, what the kids are up to. Um, you know, some days we only have four kids, some days we have 15, it really just depends. Um, but the fact that they've learned to rely on this, um, and <laughs> you can see the difference in their behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the other option that they have, the only other store in our little food desert of a downtown here is a Dollar General. Um, the kids walk there after school, they buy two liter bottles of soda and a giant bag of gummy worms and then they come and sit in the library and it's just you know a bit much but if they come in and they have a sandwich and you know some carrots and a cup of milk it's a totally different set of kids absolutely all right um we got a bunch more questions here we got plenty of time to answer them all um so all right, we'll go to this one. Um, someone wants to know if it, or let's just, okay, let's stick with this one here. Um, and I don't know if you maybe described this at the beginning more, what made the partnership happen? Um, our local school has hosted summer, me summer meals in the past and is just curious about the benefits of the partnership to the library. Um, obviously for the after school meals, you know, the school's done for the day, so that would be why you know so basically how did this all you know end up coming about um, i guess it brings people it brings kids to the library or they were coming there anyways well um, they were coming here anyway but what happened was our public schools lost um some funding um their budget was cut and the where they you know figured out that they could um 
save some money with cutting this after school program um, because they had to provide staffing for it, because they had to provide some kind of activities. They couldn't just put the kids in the um, lunchroom and forget about them. And so um, there was also, um, I'm sure it's safe to say that nobody in Amelia is listening. There was, <laughs> there was um, you know, I think some um, desire on the part of the school to, you know, elevate their brand a little bit, um, you know, and and make it, you know, because if it's happening inside the school, it's not really obvious to everybody in the community, unless you have a kid who participates in the after school meal program. If it's happening in the public library where everybody comes and goes and sees that this program is available and that it's done in partnership between the school and the library, um, that's a really good, um, you know, uh, public uh, relations message that we're putting out. Um, and the other benefit, of course, was moving it out of the public school and here to the library is that now this program is available for homeschool families, uh, which we have a lot of in the county. Oh, um, yeah. And it's available to kids who attend the small private school uh, just up the street from the library. So um, so that I don't I don't know that they, you know, you would turn someone, a homeschool family away who showed up at the school. Um, but it wouldn't be a natural thing for a homeschool family mm -hmm. to show up at the public school looking for an after school meal. Whereas here, right. um, it's open to anyone. So, um, so, you know, it makes it a more inclusive program by doing it at the library instead of the school. Um, mm -hmm. It saved them some money uh, because they were having to have staff available to stay after school, provide enrichment. Um, so it just made a, a lot of sense. Definitely. Um, all right. Someone wants to know. I'm wondering if anyone has done this without the USDA, <clears throat> without the USDA money. So, like with community members donating the food or donating the money. I mean, I we we did for a while when the um, you know before we got the after school meal program off the ground, we were you know giving out snacks in the afternoons and and things. Um, but of course. Um, and I mean, it's very rare that most of the kids who are coming here for meals, they're, they're by themselves. They're not with a parent. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know that we would feel comfortable opening ourselves up to that kind of liability with minors. Yeah. yeah. And when you're getting donations from the public too, you're always running that extra risk and also potentially not meeting nutrition needs as well. And the USDA definitely covers that. Yeah. Right. Um, and someone else actually commented before this person did, which is kind of interesting because it, it sort of relates to doing this without USDA money. But someone said um, that we found regionally that trying to meet USD standards ourselves rather than having the school do it like you all did, that it was just unfeasible. Um, yeah. and you've got to keep up the standards, make sure you're doing it right. Those of us who are solo or with just part time staff, uh, it's really something hard to do. But if you've got the USDA funding and backup and um, someone else to school or like you said a caterer or somebody um doing the the hard work i guess the harder yeah. part of getting the food together and meeting the standards yeah really i don't know that we could even manage this uh program to the extent that we do uh without that partnership i do know that the um the company that does the food service for the school i mean they're not school employees they're outside contractors so yeah. they um they, uh, you know, of course, follow whatever the USDA requirements are, but they're not actually school employees. Um, and so they contract with them separately for the preparation of these meals um, and, and the delivery of them. I mean, she drops them off on her way home from work. The head of food service over there, um, when she leaves work for the day, she swings by here and drops off our food. So. Yeah, there's definitely a chain of, I guess, communication, and we're very lucky mm -hmm. to have someone really good at the schools uh, that's head of nutrition. Um, so I guess, you know, if you don't have that, that would be a weak point, but mm -hmm. we haven't really had any communication issues so far. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's even if it's, you know, only 15 kids during the course of an entire week that come by, um, you know, the, the goodwill that it has raised from the community has been invaluable. Um, one of the other things that we do with the Amelia Food Pantry, because um, when we take the leftover meals to them, they actually break them apart um, so that all the milk can go to 
um, a single family, you know, especially if it's a family that's like living out of a motel or something like that, the single serve milks um, really come in handy for someone like that. Um, you know, that there's like a piece of fruit in each meal, they'll pull those and make like a larger bag of fruit so that they can give to a couple of different families or something like that. But we advertise through the food pantry as well. So I just went out there today to deliver our leftover meals. Um, I took a stack of our after school meals flyer. There it is. Um, and so I take those out to the food pantry periodically and they give them out. Uh, they put them in the boxes of, of food distributions to all their families. So, um, so that, you know, to try to raise awareness in the community. And of course, you know, when you're talking about kids, it's fluid, right? Um, you know, kids graduate and move on. And so you've always got new kids coming into the school right. or, you know, aging into it. And so that constant, um, reminder in their uh, food distribution boxes uh and i think she said that this week in our little tiny county they had 70 families that came in um on tuesday because they do two pickups tuesday and friday so they had 70 families come through on tuesday that's a huge number for our little tiny county yeah yeah um all right. Oh, and that answers like two questions that people got that I knew you'd already mentioned, but I was going um, to um, have you mention again. Two people asked, what did you do with leftover food? You don't yeah, need it. All goes to the food, food pantry. Yep. And is that um, each week? Whatever's every left week, week yep. is a weekly thing. Yep. I go out every Friday. So we also actually have a box in our lobby for our food collection for non-perishable items for the food pantry. Mm -hmm. So I um, take whatever's in the box. I take the leftover meals. I take flyers for like right now we have an English class going on. Um, and a lot of the families who are um, accessing the food pantry right now are Spanish speaking. So I take out flyers um, for our um, English uh, conversational English class. And they help us to promote programs really, you know, among the group of people who we are trying so hard to reach, right? The people who right. need the library most. So it is between the schools, the food pantry and the library, it has been a wonderful like strengthening of our relationships. And then once a month when I go to the Board of County Supervisors meeting, um, you know, I'm usually mentioning something about our partnership with them or you know i'll give i'll say thank you to the school you know to the specific person for continuing to help us um, administer this program and so i really try to keep it visible great all right so it looks like our questions have uh, all been answered that we had come in i don't see any new ones Great, and we will happily share with you, Krista, all of these forms that we have, that Bailey has created or the ones yeah. that we, you know, just so people can um, mm -hmm. see what we've done to organize the record keeping here. Um, you send to me or a link to the Google Drive or wherever, however you want to, we will get them um, linked up to the okay, archive great. session along with great. the slides, yeah. All right, and if anyone does have any questions and wants to talk to, um, uh, Bailey or Katerina about uh, their program and if you want to do one in your area uh, there is their contact information as well. Um, we just have some comments that did come in saying thanks for this talk so good and then a wonderful last comment here says I was hungry often as a child so a program like this would have been a blessing to me. Thank you on behalf of the hungry children in the community. Thank you so much. Yes thank you. All right thank you so much. All right